A very good evening and welcome to you all live from Pakhuis de Zwijger. We're here for a very special event tonight and it's initiated by the Center of Expertise for Creative Innovation, the Center of Economic Transformation, Amsterdam Donut Coalition and Amsterdam University of Applied Science. Tonight we will, be, we will be talking about ownership and why or how it can or even should be redesigned. Regenerative, circular, inclusive and sustainable cities require that we understand ownership differently. But how? That's the million dollar question and that we, we will be dis discussing tonight with our guests this, this evening. Our main guests tonight, and I'm very proud to welcome them here, are Kate Raworth on my right hand side. Uh, a warm welcome to you. It's an honor to have you at the table and seeing you live again, not floating on my screen. <laughs> a very warm welcome to you. And of course, my second guest is Marlene Sticker. A warm welcome. I could say you're a regular guest of Pakhuis Spijker, yeah, so but every time it's refreshing and I'm really looking forward. And I'm, a, I'm actually a little bit afraid of you. Did I ever share that? Afraid? Yes, intimidated even. Really? Really, and even though we've and known... by Kate. No, that's... I'm, I'm, only, <laughs> I'm only in awe. I'm only in awe of Kate, so <laughs> that's the thing. In awe of Kate and... F oh, yeah, I'm a little bit intimidated by me, because, yeah... Um, what does that I, tell us about us? I think, I think well, we should share it, and I'll share the whole story with a beer afterwards. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> okay, back to business. I'm sorry about this. Um, <laughs> I will be very gentle with you. <laughs> oh, no, please don't, because I enjoy being intimidated. <laughs> this, this conversation is going completely the wrong way, no! <laughs> I'm so sorry about this. This is not what I prepared. <laughs> okay, back to business series now. Tonight, <laughs> we will uh, give you insights to the models of the donut economy, uh, the donut economics and public stack. And we will reflect on some initiatives, visions and ideas that we will discuss with both our guests here and other speakers. And we will talk about ownership connected to three topics. First, land. Second, data. And third, energy. And after the conversation here on stage, there's room for the conversation here in the room as well with the audience. So please, if you've got questions, please save them uh, until the end because you've got the opportunity to ask them to all our panelists tonight. And the last thing before we start, we've asked our guests to prepare uh, advice, advice that they would, they would like to give to our new local government that's been forming right now. At the end of the different interviews, we would also like to, you all to share uh, your thoughts in regard to the things of our local government should work on first when it comes to redesigning and rethinking ownership. So besides the uh, advice for, uh, for Amsterdam, we'd always like, always like to use your thoughts and input for next programs or events we'll organize. So those are the messages I had to give. Now back to business. Let's start with our main guest for the evening, Marlene Sticker and Kate Raworth. Um, Kate, can if I start with you? Um, if we talk about ownership, why is it important to, to discuss ownership and why is that important in, the, in regard to reading designing cities? Okay, big one. And ownership is key. It sits so deeply under the design of our economies that we often never talk about it. So I'm thrilled that we're here over the, tonight as the topic of our conversation. At this critical moment in your city with a new municipal government forming, what is gonna happen over the next four years? Can ownership be transformed in this time? I'm gonna bring some pictures into this story. I'm gonna kick off with the big picture, pulling way out of Amsterdam. I would say this is humanity's selfie right now, at the beginning of the 21st century. We know millions of people are falling short on their essential needs in life without a life of dignity and community and opportunity. Leave no one in the hole in the middle of the donut. At the same time, we know that the way we are working with Earth systems, we are running down the life support systems of this planet. We must come back within the means of the planet so that we can thrive. So we want to live in the donut screen space. That's the transformation we need to make. Mm. This is a picture of a degenerative and a deeply divisive world. So we need to transform the very systems that create our economies. We need to turn from the degenerative, linear, take, make, use, lose that we've inherited, that runs down the living systems of the world and make them into a circular, cyclical, regenerative economy 
where resources aren't used up, they're used again and again, far more carefully, collectively, creatively, and slowly. That is the first big dynamic shift we need to make. How can transforming ownership be part of making that happen? I think it's key. Yeah. The second big dynamic shift is that we've inherited economies that are divisive by design, often through regulation, through privilege, through inheritance, through infrastructure. They tend to capture value and opportunity in the hands of a few people. That's going to leave many people falling short on the essentials with others massively overconsuming. How can we therefore create economies that are distributive by design so that resources and value are shared far more collectively with all who co-create? Ownership is really key to deciding whether we end up with divisive or distributive economies. So with those two dynamics, I want to start economic thinking all over again. The first picture I'm going to bring is what I call the embedded economy. Right? So let's recognize that whether we're talking about the city, the nation, or the world, our economies are embedded in society. An economy is a social construct surrounded and held by laws and customs and political systems and culture. And if it's a social construct, it means we can reconstruct it. That's the good news. So we can redesign our economies. And we're embedded in the living world. And we must make economies that are compatible with the workings of the living world. But if we dive inside this economy, we see there are different ways that we meet our wants and needs. Now, mainstream economics always starts with the market. Welcome to Econ 101. Here is the market. And who we think we are, the characteristics, the roles, and the values, and the skills we bring there, it's like, are you a consumer or a producer? Are you shopping or working or shopping or working? And if you're working, are you labor just getting the wage, or are you the capital owner getting the dividend? That really, as Karl Marx taught us, hey, that matters every time. The qualities, the skills that we are, have been told in economics that we need to bring to this space are about competition, self-interest. That's what makes a good market economist. I completely disagree. And we need to have a far broader sense of ourselves in the economy. Mainstream economics says, OK, you've got the market, now let's add the state, where we may be a public servant, a resident, a voter, a protester, crucial roles that we play. And I would say most economics courses, and therefore most of our thinking, and therefore most of our political debate, just deals with these two, the public and the private, the market and the state. Oh, we can have public-private partnerships. OK, that's key, but we're missing two essential other parts of our economies. We're missing the household, where we all begin every day, unpaid caring work as a parent, a partner, a relative, a child. That is key to our well-being, and it calls on completely different skills of care, of empathy, of collaboration, of raising those social skills in our children and each other, and, crucially, the commons, which were, have been neglected for so long. But Eleanor Ostrom, the first woman to get a, a Nobel Prize in this area, she said, the commons actually can be a triumph. And there we can be stewards and co-creators and sharers and repairers. For people not familiar with yes. the commons, what exactly are the commons? So the commons are where we come together, not through markets. I don't, I'm not paying and buying and selling things. And I'm not through the state providing a public service. It's where we people come together and say, if we work together and follow the shared set of rules, we can co-create something that we collectively value. That could be Wikipedia on the World Wide Web. That could be a garden on the corner of our neighborhood block. We're sharing resources, we're following rules together, and we're creating value. No money may change hands. So it's a really important form of shared stewardship and ownership that just got lost mm -hmm. from our thinking for too long. Yeah. And I think tonight is a really important moment of bringing it back to the center of our thinking. Yeah. Because the values, the skills, the qualities that it takes to make a good commoner is about sharing and stewarding and not competing uh, and possessing, but rather recognizing collective goods. So to me, the 21st century skills that we need to bring back are definitely around the commons. Yeah. Now, as I said, we've seen for decades public-private partnerships between companies and the state. And we can think of partnerships across all of these borders because these separate sectors actually work best when they figure out how to work together. And I think what we're here to talk about tonight is 
the overlap between the commons and the state. And let's call that the room for public civic partnerships. There are too few of them because the commons was neglected and the, I think the state just focused so much on working with the market. I think tonight is about saying what kind of commons civic partnerships and public partnerships could exist? How do we invent them? What are the legal forms? What are the contracts? What are the language? Where are the examples already existing in this city? I would love over the next four years of this city's new government to see this thrive and take off. So let me just give a couple of examples from other places of public civic partnerships. You can have them in, um, in housing, cooperative housing, land trust housing, where the community works together with the local municipality or the state to create community-led housing in Vienna and many other places. Energy creation, cooperatives working together to create solar energy, wind energy. This can be so expanded, and I know there's some amazing energy projects in the room here tonight around digital democracy, whether in Barcelona, but I, I bet uh, Marlene's also already got lots of ideas for taking it far deeper than what's happening in Barcelona. How can the state recognize the commons as a space for democratic digitization? Mm. And then also enterprise design in the city in Preston, in the UK, really recognizing the power of the city of anchor institutions to encourage social enterprise, commons enterprise. So there are so many different areas, and I'm going to be listening tonight to the examples I know we're going to hear from in many of these different areas. So I'm going to finish with this. Civic, public civic partnerships in Amsterdam, I think, are going to be designed to work with a purpose and the way they network, the way they're governed, owned, and financed. And to me, the questions are, what is Amsterdam to make this work? What is Amsterdam going to stop doing? What is it going to let go of and leave behind? What is this city going to start doing, spread and amplify? So in each of these areas, what old stories are holding this city back about its purpose, its vision and its mission? And what new shared vision needs to be created to enable public civic partnerships mm. to go forward? In terms of networks, which connections are missing? Which networks don't yet exist that need to be created? The relationships that don't yet exist? But what's already underway that's in this room that can be celebrated and amplified? In terms of governance, whose voice has been missing from the debate? And therefore, what new agreements, what new rules, hard rules, soft rules, what new agreements are needed, what new legal forms to make this public civic partnerships work? When it comes to ownership, what assumptions need unlocking around what it means to own something or steward something? How can ownership be reimagined? from the examples we hear and far beyond. And then finance, lastly, how is finance a barrier? And we know that in many cases, finance, the legal form or its existence is a barrier. And how can finance actually serve this vision coming to life in this city? So I'm gonna be sitting here listening <laughs> this evening with these in my mind, because I really want to learn from what I know is already happening in this city, because I think a lot of other places want to take inspiration from here and make it happen even further. Right. I think you, I completely agree with you. And if we see the presentation, I, I think nobody could disagree. But still, if we, what does it take in order to create a tipping point where old systems are, are being let, let, we let go of old systems and create this knowledge that you have and create an, a new economy in a sense or a different economy? Because one and a half years ago, I was quite hopeful. We saw the pandemic. We saw where, where the system failed that would be a tipping point in order to recreate new working systems and the donor economy would be like the, the way to go to, in my perception at least. Still, we didn't use that momentum in order to create that change. And now we're back in the old world again. So what do we as mankind, as a society need in order to create, do create that tipping point? And it's the question of our era, I think, because there is so much energy and momentum and people are like, where is this tipping point? When is it coming? And of course, tipping points look obvious when you look back. Mm. And it might be tomorrow and it might be five years. I don't know. But what I do know, what I've learned from the work I'm doing with Donut Economics, is the power of peer-to-peer -peer inspiration mm. is huge. When we see and get inspiration, but also permission from what other people have already started doing. When we can name it. So we need the language. Yeah. 
We need, the, we need to know what the commons are. We need to talk about public civic partnerships. It needs to become a part of our language. But we also need examples that we can visit, see images of, go to. Look, it's actually happening in this neighborhood. Right. It's a huge question then. Well, why can't it happen here too? Yeah. So the proof of practice to me is massive. So, so I think, again, some of the stories we might hear from tonight, you said, well, that's just one example in one neighborhood. The point is it's proof of practice yeah. and that has the potential to build towards that tipping point. Great. Thank you so much for now. But the proof of practice, the proof is in the pudding, <laughs> in that sense. The donut pudding. The donut pudding. <laughs> um, thank you so much for now. We will continue our conversation, and you will be joining here at the table all night. But, Marlene, I would, would like to go to you, because you introduced the comments in my perception as well. And um, we, you've got the clicker now. <laughs> Very good. Um, but still, um, the public stack is, a, is, is something you're working on. Can you, can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about the public stack? Yes, I think um, um, public stack, you will find a lot of terminology because it's both partly also in inspired, of course, by the work of, uh, of Kate. Um, uh, the public stack is trying to understand how technology is shaped, and it's not just one application. There's a whole layer of technologies stacked. Uh, th this is the idea of the stack. Mm. There's, there's a lot of layers on top of it. And it's not just enough to do one layer. We need to, to rethink all the layers, which is basically, that's why I said, if, if you see a, a, the world, uh, the applications, normally it would be tech society, the world normally there would only be applications. But it's, if you f look at energy, then there's a lot of layers in which we, that there's, there's the internet under, underlying the energy transition, for mm. example. A lot of technologies are smart meter, less or more smart, smart meters. So, um, and all of these technologies that are underlying these transitions are at the moment closed, black boxed. So we don't really understand how they work. Mm. We are vendor locked in by companies that uh, are also extractive in the sense that they extract data and extract value out of it. There's a huge uh, eco, uh, ecological footprint of the technologies that we use. Um, so for that, we have, this, we have to have I have to raise the same questions about the technology that we use. A lot of people say, well, we solve it with blockchain, we solve it with technologies, we will make something smart, and then it will be... But then they forget that there is that smart and, and, and 5G and, and autonomous systems all use data, electricity and energy. So there is also an ecological footprint. Mm. So the stack is, public stack is saying, let's, if we think about public values, we want to bring these public values into all layers of society. So where we want, where should we go? Uh, and then we want to have the technologies which are free in the sense of freedom. Mm -hmm. So not in the sense of free beer, but like fr that we understand that we have the accessibility to, the, to, to understand readable technologies that we have. Uh, public uh, governance, we need interoperability so that the, these citizens do talk to each other instead of being vendor locked in. We want society in control instead of big tech in control or, or the state in control. Uh, you want to be regenerative, the same terminology that you use, instead, instead of extractive. Data minimization, instead of uh, we expand and make more and more data because, well, in itself it would be good. Well, let's be more critical about it. What do we want to datafy and which, which don't we want to datafy? Mm. And of course, the fair and sustainability. So if you uh, look at the, let's see where I'm going. Da, da, da. Me, yeah, there we are. So you, you can abstract from this idea of the of the of the what's underneath the surface. So it's a technology stack underneath the surface what we see. Then there is a design process which which makes the technology because it's man-made. It's not just coming doesn't grow out of the, the 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 ground. It's not coming from God. So we people we make these technologies. So so we bring our values into the technology that we use. And underlying that there is a foundation. So the tech stack looks a little bit like this. Uh, there's infrastructure, equipment, firmware, hardware, operating systems, applications, and they're all kind of layers, data and protocols and so on. There are a lot of different ways to make, to, 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 to design or to, to, to visualize the stack. Uh, so if we want to have that a safe and just public stack like this, we, we need to fig figure out how to make that uh, work. So we have the, the perspective of, um, and of course this is, a, this is a simplification. So we have the state version where the state is controlling the technology, or you have the private stack. Well, we part, sort of in both at the moment. Mm. Part of it is state-oriented, part of it is private-owned. Uh, but if we want to bring public values in, in, inside, of what we, in our, inside of our societies, then we have to build these public values inside of these technologies, where we are citizens, not consumers, or, uh, or subject to like, like, for me, burger is always a very difficult term 
because it only tells us how we relate to government. Mm. It doesn't say something about how we relate to each other. Yeah. So in the Dutch context, the, the term burger is always, to me, very complicated. The term citizens tells us that we are citizens. We, we together create a democracy or society. Um, so, but then we need open technologies. So we have to be sure that we can read and that we have access to the technologies. And underlying those principles are, th these are resources. So we have to organize them as commons, data commons, algorithm commons, open source. And especially, of course, in the technology field, there's a lot of commons. Mm -hmm. A lot of the stuff that we use on a daily basis are based on open source mm -hmm. or on open data. So the, com the whole notion of, sort of like the, 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 the revival of the commons is specifically also in the public domain. Mm -hmm. So the maker movement is using open hardware, uh, open knowledge, uh, open access. So there's, there's a lot of really good practices in the technology field where this ownership is already different than, than we know. So if you go to the foundation, I think this is where you have to express that technology is not neutral, that we have, an, that it's also important, like, where are we optimizing for? Mm -hmm. This is the first question. Yeah. For what kind of world do, are we optimizing? And do clarify for me, technology is not neutral, why not? Uh, because we put our technology is not neutral because it's man-made, and we put our values inside of the technology. Yeah. Um, so it's it's um, so the technology is not like how we use it. It's also in the design of the, yeah. uh, the a protocol, for example, can have you you use this uh, the, the image of the centralized and distributed. At the heart of, of the internet is a distributed protocol TCP/IP, which means a different type of governance than a centralized. Uh, uh, in with the Corona Melder with the proximity measurement. There was a whole fight between two protocols. Either we put this, the data that we measure and on centrals, on centralized, or we do it distributed. So these are different worldviews on how to organize power in the networks. Uh, the second one is, of course, um, are we putting human rights at the center? And what are they? How do we inter interpret them? Uh, how to make them really uh, uh, important again? If we look at how we regulate technology at the moment, it's done as from the perspective of, of product safety which is really something else than, than take, use the, the, the human rights as, as a principle. A third is, of course, the social economic considerations and models that we use. Who owns it? The questions about ownership is important. Um, who profits from it? Uh, who not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> at the cost of whom? Eh? If you look at our gadgets, the, the, the conflict wars, the Colton that you just mentioned, the gold that we use for our technologies. And thirdly, it's of course yeah, the governance. How do we supervision? And this is not something that you can add to, 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 the, to the table at the end. This is mm -hmm. what you have to express at the beginning. So and then we talk about the design process. So if we take these four principles, you have to be very explicit what your values are. What is your value system? And then you bring those values into the design process. And of course, it should be much more uh, inclusive. Like uh, who is at the table at the moment? Who is part of this? The, the, this di design process, who defines, so all these kind of questions come back into this idea of the methodologies that you use to design the technologies, and also our energy system, and also all the other systems that we have, because the technologies are, of course, intertwined with the health system, and the mobility system, and, and the energy system. So, again, I think uh, we come back to the idea that if we want to change the idea of ownership, we have to also make different new constell constellations, new configurations. And this image tries to say, tell the same what you have presented. And there's a lot of, of course, we have, we're very much on the same page here. So the public-private part is being very dominant. And, and if you go to governance, and for, like, for example, in the energy transition, th there's, there's the legal system, a financial system, a procurement. All the systems are there for public-private partnerships. When you go for public-civic partnerships, it's, it's lacking. We, people don't really understand how to do it. Governments still have the have the, the have the like a like a they look at individual citizens, and not in collective action. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of, of civic partnerships and civic action is something that only I think the, the, the trying to figure out the language, but also how to organize it, how what a legal structure should be, what are the what how can we open up procurement, eh, the right to right to challenge, for example, is one of those. All these kind of instruments we need to develop. So in the end, what we want to do, of course, is have this new type of ownerships, new type of like models that we work mm -hmm. together uh, so that we have a safe and just future or a digital future. Great. Um, what I wonder is uh, what space does um, research or even innovation take place when, uh, when you have this perspective? 
Because uh, isn't it just the, the, the idea of, of making something new and profiting from that yourself, isn't that the idea that drives innovation, or am I mistaken? No, I think you're mistaken, because I think a lot of the... If you look, if you look into, for example, Arduino, which is an open hardware uh, platform, it enables so many people to make new stuff, but it's a shared, so you share what the outcomes are, it's not owned. Mm. Uh, so, the, no, I think innovation can thrive also because you collaborate. Yeah. And this is one of those narratives that we are stuck to, that we, that innovation comes from competitiveness. Yeah. And this is, this is like the underlying principle, the underlying language that we use, the narrative that we use. From, from school on, we are in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. But I'm a, a, the super cooperator is more successful than the competitor. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so we have to come up with another narrative, another language, but also other ways that we deal with innovation. Right. And at the moment, I think it's really problematic because if you look at how science is being uh, financed, they have to first go to big corporate companies to co-finance research. And then, of course, those companies will define what's important. And then all the new stuff that new people can do, researchers have to, to comply with powers that be. Mm. So there is a, there's not a lot of room for innovators that really want to challenge the power structures that be. But in your scenario, when you should collaborate with each other, how do you, how do you make sure that even in design and in, in the process as well, it's equally shared, the, the, the designing process, but also the, 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 the resources? How do yeah. you make sure that's equally shared? Well, I think we, there, we can learn a lot about, um, about open source development and, and open hardware development. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's and that that is also what we can learn from the com comments and and from the design rules of, of Eleanor Ostrom, it's not an anarchy. So so you have to have specific rules how to develop and how to share. Mm -hmm. So it's it and so it, this kind of design rules for sharing, for creating together, for 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 building up this kind of shared resources, um, we have to relearn. So th th this is old knowledge, uh, and, and now at the moment, if, and this is why I'm really interested in also learning from the practices that we hear, because in a, I've, I've been close to the energy transition uh, because we have to get rid of the aardgas, aardgasvrije wijken. Mm. I have no clue how to translate that. Thank you. Getting on. <laughs> oh, ah, there, there are some uh, other <laughs> practitioners. I see. Yeah. Um, so I had a chance to look at a lot of those initiatives, and then we saw that a lot of... Um, citizens were faster than governments, yeah. than local governments, uh, setting up corporations. But then they have to sort of relearn how to do that. And then they learn from each other. So I've, I've, I totally agree with Kate that this is so, so energetic because you learn from each other. But also in the field of land ownership, that, that, that was there, and then, then we lost it, and now we have to bring it back. Yeah. So it's a lot of old knowledge that we have, have to, to in the food production. In, yeah. in, well, so a cooperation is not an old... Uh, is, is, vivid and live again. Yeah. But still we have to unlearn the systems that we are applying right now. But then we also have to rewrite, rethink our narrative yeah. about who we are and what is actually... And th then we come to the whole idea, what is growth or degrowth or what is, what is thriving? So you always come with the term thriving instead of growth, yeah. which is really important. You change the whole... If you change the language and the, and the, and the concepts, we can really make a difference. But yeah. if we sk stick to this old language, then we have a problem. Let's go to the next stage of the programme, because there we will discuss uh, about redesigning the ownership of data. Uh, and I would like to invite to the table Troy Nachtigal and Jake Block. Please give them a warm hand. Troy Nachtigal is a professor of fashion research and technology at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, and Jake Block is an entrepreneur and co-founder of Digital Rights House. A warm welcome to you both. Um, you're a lector of fashion technology at the HVA and the head of wearable data studio. Can you tell us a little bit more? What do you actually do? Yeah, so what I like to do is I like to take data to make stuff. <laughs> and that stuff is usually clothing, and I'm fairly obsessed with shoes. And that really comes out of this whole digital fabrication aspect that we've been looking at recently. Over the last 20 years, we've learned to make things with pure data. And the way that we design and make those things has changed and is changing rapidly. And that we don't sit down with a 3D program or sketch out anymore. We're able to use code and syntax, thanks to platforms like Arduino that taught us all to teach when we were small kids, uh, to actually build stuff. And so instead of like making cell phones, we're making shoes with that data. And we're starting to look at the materials that make those shoes and starting to understand how do we really bring these things together as objects. So data gets physicalized into objects, 
which allows us to do some really interesting things where we start to plug the, the data of the city and plug the data of the person into a thing to make it. Can you give an example of that? Uh, these shoes that we're seeing right here, uh, the, these shoes are based upon data that, that surround my feet and how my form and how the idea of the shoe come together to make a shoe. And what's interesting is that when you define the shoe with data, you're able to also look at that physical shoe and bring data back off of it. Mm. We now have 3D scanners that are available in our cell phones and our iPads that can actually 3D scan that. And we can compare the digital model to the actual physical scan of what we're looking at now and see how it's changed over time. And if we talk about ownership in that regard, yeah. how should we, re we see that? What gets to be really interesting here is that we are not the only user of our things anymore. When our things start to make data, there are different owners. Uh, there are different people using the device with us. It's a cooperative role. I might use the shoes to walk in, but if the shoes are making data, somebody's using those da that data to learn about the city, to mm -hmm. make more shoes. So we, we run into a co-user situation. And, and then the responsibility of it, how do you, how you take responsibility of that data? And can I you know, influence as well who I can share the data with or not? Well, that's what's really interesting at this point. If we look at who gathers the data now, it's not being gathered by anybody but the really big companies. And we know that they're getting into this. We see the patents from, say, Amazon that already have a personalization platform for clothing. And they, they've patented the entire process in 2017, saying that in the future, only they will make clothes with data. So what happens when the guy who owns the bookstore starts saying that he's the only person who can make the books or the clothes that you're going to wear as well, much less space programs? <laughs> right. We will return to you in a moment, mm -hmm. uh, but Jake, you are, the, uh, are an entrepreneur and you're also the co-founder of Digital Rights House. What is that? What is Digital Right ha Rights House and how are you organized? Ah, very good. Um, Digital Rights House is a foundation and uh, that's how we're organized. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, it was started um, because we think that it's necessary to accelerate the pace in which, um, yeah, say, uh, basic... Uh, um, guarantees need to be in place for uh, citizens, if you, um, uh, you say it in English, um, and then in a, uh, in a city context. Mm. Um, yeah, to make it practical, um, um, say uh, something happens with you online, it could be uh, that somebody takes over your identity or that you receive some type of uh, nasty picture, or whatever happens, it's a very broad topic. Mm -hmm. um, who do you call? And at this moment, that's not clear. So I would say that uh, a function um, needs to be um, yeah, implemented, uh, at least that it's more clear for every citizen um, how to approach a certain situation. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on in this respect, but um, it's um, not clear where you have to be. So that's a very, say, I, I call that deep, uh, mm -hmm. deep in, in society. Um, uh, today, uh, a team was at a school uh, in, in Amsterdam in West, and um, um, just being there saying that you're the, the help desk for digital human rights, uh, 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 having talks with the, the, the parents, with the, 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 the students, uh, with the teachers, uh, the, the neighborhood, etc. Um, uh, just being there um, um, uh, meant that uh, some people approached uh, the team and shared, uh, start sharing their, uh, say, um, stories. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm going from, say, a very uh, deep uh, approach where you have real contact with, with citizens to something I call high. Um, um, where we all talk uh, more and more about these, uh, say, human rights. Yeah. Uh, and uh, 75 plus years ago, there was a document and privacy, dignity, and, uh, brotherhood. Maybe it's not the right term anymore. But um, um, how how do you translate that to a uh, uh, day-to-day life, uh, right? And um, so, um, one of these topics, for instance, is privacy. Yeah. Uh, and um, so what uh, is a GDPR in Euro Europe enough? Is the data act that is coming enough? Is now we all know about these things, mm -hmm. but it's very abstract, right? So yeah. um, how do you say uh, enforce it in real, real life? And um, the other side of Digital Rights House is that we go to the UN and that we have contact with the, say the local government in this sense, uh, the city of Amsterdam. And uh, yeah, we were fortunate enough to say uh, uh, create a partnership for a couple of years, and every six weeks we give advices to the city uh, what should be uh, changed. Yeah, uh, um, we're not the only one, uh, but at least it's an extra effort to speed up the pace of uh, 
creating new functions in the city. And is, is, you are collaborating with the uh, local government in Amsterdam, but still, it, it's been stated a lot of times, privacy, privacy is something of the past, and even new generations, they consider privacy not to be important anymore. So the, the fight you're fighting, it's, it's nice, but people, don't, people are not really willing to, to, to commit to that. Yeah, so I disagree, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, Obviously, I wouldn't like to uh, uh, see everybody in the face, but I'm going to look at, at you. But um, um, I would call it, uh, we live in a time, we, um, it's called the privacy opportunity. Uh, we have a, it's a time to do it, rethink it, to uh, approach it differently. Mm. So um, um, next to, say, being one of the co-founders of uh, Digital Rights House, which is currently 35 people um, uh, within a year. Um, so I, I don't want to take any credit, it's the team. Um, but um, I'm also an entrepreneur, and we, we decided to, uh, with a group of other people, to start a, a communication platform that does not want your data. Mm. So imagine a WhatsApp that doesn't want your data. Uh, that's what we're making. Um, signal, you mean? <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe, and then we, then we have a nice discussion, so yeah. hopefully we can do that. Mm. Um, but um, uh, if you look at, say, what is uh, presented uh, just a couple of moments ago, uh, you can have the application, but how it's organized under, say, water uh, mm. um, is all obviously what, uh, what's important. So w where's the data? Who's hosting it? Um, uh, we all talk about blockchain. Um, how does it work? Uh, is it transparent? Stuff like that. So um, our company also um, is into that. So, and then but still, it's, it's great that you're developing those new projects. If you talk about a signal compared to, for example, yeah. WhatsApp, we, the people, aren't willing to switch because it's maybe less convenient. How, how, why are you making those big statements? Because because because, because what I what I notice is that if you look at the numbers, WhatsApp is no, but, no, no, of course. But but if you look at food safety, we have such an enormous system in place to yeah. make our food safe. Yeah. We're only starting to make our digital applications safe. Mm -hmm. There's, there's not, not such a thing as if, if you look at how we prepare food, the 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 the, the cooling for the food, the how people have the the, the shoes that the, the the chefs need to wear. Exactly, but so but it's very but sophisticated. So we only started 30 years too late. But it's it's, it's, about, it's about awareness, I believe. No, no, but, every, but, but, but we're just me, saying me, that people don't have to. Because I want to finish my statement. I know, I know. See, that's why I'm that's intimidated. Why yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what, well, what I would like it. to say is that in regard to, 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 to the awareness is that uh, if your food is, isn't good for your health, it impacts you immediately. And something that is so abstract as privacy or data that's being used or you being the product because the product is free, um, th that awareness, and that's what I mean, is not, is not there yet. And that, doesn't that keep us away from switching to to know the new initiatives. Yeah, so I, I think it's a fair point, but um, maybe you can approach it differently. Um, uh, every, uh, in every city, at every moment, something's happening with your data. And mm -hmm. um, um, I, um, let's, let, me, um, let me give some examples. Um, the last two years, if we wanted to go to a restaurant, we needed to uh, give some, uh, yeah. some data. Uh, it was um, on a piece of paper, and they had to say, keep it uh, for a couple of weeks. Um, not really the people that are very, say, experienced in uh, that role. Um, um, uh, if, um, uh, if I say that uh, on a given day, uh, more than a thousand young people under 16 experience some type of harassment uh, in a s part of Amsterdam, um, uh, do we let it go, or do we think we have to do something about it? Um, I'm, I just don't want to end up in a negative uh, conversation, but right. the opportunity we have, because it's technology, is that we can create it. Uh, mm. So it's only a couple of decisions to be made. Uh, and I, I, my, if I have a little opportunity here, um, I look at it from a, a certain perspective. Transparency, control, ownership, value. And... Um, uh, transparency, we think that's a solution, but mm. um, half of the people say don't care, uh, but if the people that care, uh, they find out that, oh, if it's like that, uh, I want to control it. Right? Now, um, so now you know where your data is, but I want to change it. Mm. Now, half of the people don't care, right? Uh, mm. But a part, um, and they say, okay, I would like to alter it, uh, but they can't. Mm. Uh, and that's the problem. The problem is that there's not a freedom of choice at the moment. 
um, for everybody uh, to, on their own terms, to de uh, decide which data is shared with whom. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I'm not going into, say, the commons perspective, who do you give the power and how do you do it, mm -hmm. but from an individual uh, standpoint, um, I want uh, the tooling to decide on uh, my terms what I share with whom, yeah. when. And you should have the opportunity in order to do that. Yeah, and that's where the ownership for me at least uh, comes in, and just uh, sorry for it all the time, but is that um, um, if, I'm, uh, if I trust that I have 100% control, mm -hmm. maybe I don't want ownership. Yeah. Uh, but I don't trust I have 100% control, so I'm going one layer deeper and yeah. to, dis to discover who's owning which data. And then you have a problem because you do not own it. Yeah. And then the last question, I think we all uh, resonate on that, is that um, what type of city, what type of mm. world do you want to live in? And UN, the UN says it uh, very nicely, and that's a uh, people-first digital world. Yeah. I love technology, but it's not people-first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and how was your response to that? How do you, because I, I think that data you're describing is, 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 is collective data, and, and the data and privacy that you're describing is, is, is individual almost. That's where I would argue for a commons, mm. uh, because what's happening is that the government and the big companies already have this data, and they're taking over everything else yeah. with that. We need that ability to take that data out of the big companies, which we have with their ability to take out. We have this idea of being able to bring it to the people that we want to have use it. Mm. The small company can't do big data or machine learning because they don't have those massive amounts of computation to look at. But if we can bring our data to those services, we get this ability to start having other companies and people who are closer to us doing it locally with us. Mm. And they might understand us a lot better and might care for us a lot better because of the fact that we do live together as citizens in the same city. Yeah. I'd love to see fashion designers working for the people that they live with and that they know instead of you know working with people halfway around the world to do things that are for people that they've never ever going to meet. Yeah. I see you nodding in agreement. Uh, is that a feasible scenario? Oh, I don't know, because I think, I think we're at the beginning of new legal designs and contract designs that yep. haven't yet been created. Mm -hmm. And the thing that makes me... Um, the thing I always keep sitting back and remembering whenever it seems... When this seems, you know, complex and hard, and how can we imagine it? I, I remind myself, the business models that we need barely have begun to exist yet. Just as Marlene is saying, the public stack that we want to build has barely been created yet, but you know, we've had 30 years of food safety regulations. Yeah. Let's create it. And it includes creating new contract kinds. It creates new kinds of intellectual property forms. Think of when the Creative Commons licensing were created and you can choose which one you use. Suddenly, boom, a whole design of possible kinds of Creative Commons become available. Yeah. When before that, we would have said, what do you mean creative commons? I don't understand. How do you put an idea? So we need to create the forms. Mm. We need fabulous lawyers working to say this kind of contract will work with this. Da, da, da. To make the legal forms, to, we need the legal forms plus the language, plus the examples, and then it can happen. Mm. What I think is really interesting there is when we start to work with Web3 technologies and the collaborative contracts, and yes, there is some, some lawyers there, but we are finding ways of writing those contracts for the production of a single-use sweater. You know, one person, one designer, one wearer, one purchase, one contract, and then it's done. And, and that's where I'm really fascinated with where NFTs and Web3 take us in this sense of we can do very small contracts mm. and have ways of making royalties for every sale past that. And it enables something that... Yeah, in, in my PhD work, we couldn't do. It was the big stoppage of we don't have the legal framework for this. Yeah. And those frameworks are coming, and they're starting to emerge. And what was made for digital art, and when we start to apply it to, with two objects, things get very interesting very quickly. Marlene, uh, if you talk about regulation, and if you take food uh, safety as an example, the, then at that time, the government was in the lead in order to define what was needed. Who do you think should be in the lead when we talk about those new developments? Is, should anybody be in the lead? Well, I think Creative Commons was uh, coming from more civic action and some scientists, uh, like researchers, uh, coming together. So I think Creative Commons in the Netherlands was a, a, co a collaborative thing of, of Kennisland, Waag, and the University of Amsterdam, the Institute for Information Rights. Mm. So we, together with some funding from the Ministry of OCW, 
were able to establish the Dutch chapter for Creative Commons. Yeah. So that kind of collaboration. So and and but it comes from people that make that that, that come with up with the the purpose. I mean, yeah. I think it starts with that we want to share, and then you need. Uh, and it was also against. I mean, at that, at that moment in time, people were jailed because they shared uh, their the, uh, content online. The, the pirate party, all that uh, stuff. So it, uh, 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 some people re even end up in jail for a long time, or people were um, um, were harassed and then killed themselves, like um, Aaron Schwartz. So it, this it has it was a nightmare. So coming up with Creative Commons was also an answer to mm -hmm. a regime that was actually um, criminalizing everybody online. Mm. So um, so I think it comes from civic action first. Mm. I think if I look now at uh, what's now happening in the digital domain, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, European Commission is very active now involved in GDPR, privacy, uh, of course, but also the Digital Market Act, the Digital Service Act, the AI Act, uh, behavioral advertising, to, 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 to also to make it impossible to have behavioral advertisement. This is politics, but there's a huge group of people versus big tech, 70 million Europeans are now gathered in a lobby against big tech. Yeah. So yeah, they, the politics will do something when we as a civic society want them to do something. Yeah. In the city of Amsterdam, four years ago, we started to have the first debate on technology, like the, the digital city. The, yeah. And then all these politicians were asking, do we have a position here? So they were like, my God, we have to discuss technology. <laughs> this year we did, a, we did a, the same four years later. And they all were well prepared, and and they were they had a very actively. So we take a stand. We we know what what we do and don't want from smart city. Mm. So yes, I think I think it's it, the political positions are developing, but at the moment the 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 it, it's it's the the um, it, it has to come from us wanting this, and I'm not saying that uh, I just want to little one. If if we should not ask everybody to. Take the, to to say I want my privacy to be uh, uh, captured because, as with food, a lot of people go, go for the cheapest, yeah, yeah, the lowest. So that that should not be the value that we put in our society. I think people that are responsible, that are part of, uh, that, that have the money to, to spend, yeah. to do the procurement, they should go for the human rights, go for the public values, yeah. in their companies, in their organizations, and so on. So as, and then of course. We have to be sure that nobody has to sell their organs, like yeah. we do with our with people that, that we say we shouldn't. You should. There's a. There's a. Um, you should not be able in the position that you have to sell part of your body to yeah. be able to have access to, for example, medicine. So we sh you sh people should not be in a position that to to use free services and then have to pay with their yeah. with themselves. Right. Um, we're fi entering the final stage of this part of the conversation, and you've prepared an advice for the new local government or the new coalition. What is your advice? Uh, my advice is that we need a commons where we can bring our data to, and probably not run by the government, but somehow a format that allows other people to do things with it, and that we can see that it's transparent. We need the ability to have, you know, 10,000 people bring us their data so we can make shoes for specific people by looking at the big data mm. that's generated from those 10,000 people. But they opt into it, and they are there to say it. And the data exists. It's already in companies like Google that know where we go and how we go there. We just need to take it out and put it someplace else so that other people can do something with it. Great. Thank you so much. And your advice? Yeah, I gave in the preparation 10, but I was <laughs> only allowed one. So, uh, um, but uh, exactly, yeah, yeah. That's, but you, some people are intimidating, so... Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> I meant my... No, 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 <laughs> no, please don't. <laughs> now, the fun thing with this, uh, this um, the, the whole program thing is that we, we're all in the same uh, corner, so in a, if we would debate, uh, we want um, to thrive in somehow. But my own... Um, uh, first, my opinion is that my the first advice would be uh, freedom of choice, how you log on when you um, yeah, go online. Mm -hmm. um, so um, let me just explain it shortly. Um, now I can do all the nine other advices. <laughs> no, but um, um, joking. Um, we live in a world, in my opinion, that um, we uh, passed the break-even point of why we use the internet. So mm -hmm. uh, a couple years ago, it was for information, you could say, in a simple uh, way. Uh, but now it's for interaction. 
Yeah? And we not only interact with people, but also with stuff or machines. So if, uh, if you look a couple years ahead, then you can imagine that the interactions will grow. Mm. And we, we also live in a world that every time we go online or are connected, we register mm -hmm. as an individual. Um, meaning that to be online, you are a registered user. Mm -hmm. um, then it starts. So my first advice would be uh, um, rapidly uh, create something of a freedom of choice, how you log on. Yeah. If you pay for something, you choose a bank and a method. Mm -hmm. If you log on, you don't. Yeah. It's not the future that we go to the OBA and log on with Facebook. It's not mm -hmm. the future that in, uh, in Amsterdam you can log on with IRMA or DigiD, which is good. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in Belgium or France, we need another system. If mm -hmm. we live in an international global world, what, we also need some solutions that are global. Yeah. And that's the problem at the moment. There's not a real... Uh, but who owns that data? for logging in, because that's a question, even when it's international, with international regulations, it's, it's difficult to have that supervision. Yeah, so in my opinion, when we talk about data, I focus on person data. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, by law, it's like your name and your um, mm -hmm. the yeah. moment that you were born, etc. But I think I consider all data person data. Every mm -hmm. data is at the end of the day mm -hmm. traceable to you. Um, so who owns this? Uh, at this moment, I do not. No, so who supervises that? If, if, it's not, uh, if it's owned by all, who In, supervises that? Yeah, so at the end of the day, but this is a personal opinion, so Digital Rights House would say, uh, I'm pro everything that gives uh, citizens more, uh, say, power uh, towards other organizations. Mm. Um, on a personal perspective, I think there's still also a debate which data as an individual you use. Okay. Thank you so much. Time is up, but thank you so much for your contributions. A warm hand for them. In this next phase of the programme, we will talk about the redesigning of ownership of energy. And I would like to invite Anne Stijkel and Noortje van Klees to the table. Uh, if I'd like to introduce Noortje van Kleef, she's the president of EcoStrom. And Anne Stijkel is the founder of the Groene Hub en Co-Kratos and the creator of the Donut Deal, a practical translation of the donut, uh, donut uh, econ economics. Anne, we will start with a video of you, so let's have a look. Nou, je hebt een donut, iedereen weet het vormpje. En uh, het middenin is eigenlijk waar de meeste mensen toch wel in zitten. Hè? In het survival, survival uh, mode, zou ik maar zeggen. Kate Rayworth, de bedenker van de donut-economie, is in juni 2019 in Amsterdam en loopt tegen een complete verrassing aan. Kate kwam bij ons uh, echt in een verrassing terecht. Ze wist, nou ja, je ziet het ook wel aan haar gezicht. Uh, die donut taart die was natuurlijk helemaal te gek. Ze ziet haar eigen donut economie aan de muur hangen. En ze wordt gevraagd om de donut deal te ondertekenen. Ze denkt, in welke film ben ik terechtgekomen? En, maar ze, 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 ze kreeg tranen in de ogen. Hier hadden ze nu ook donut deals. Initiatieven die de buitenkant van de donut, acties die goed zijn voor de planeet, verbinden met de binnenkant, met sociale duurzaamheid. Zodat mensen niet in het gat vallen. Uh, dat we allemaal weg van die sham en die pudding kunnen genieten. That's a great introduction. <laughs> and a statement was made that we all can enjoy the, 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 the pudding and the donut as, and the jam as well. A uh, warm welcome to you. Uh, at the moment you work for a local energy co cooperative and it's called EcoStorm. Can you tell us a bit oh, more? She's from EcoStorm. Oh, sorry, no, yeah, no, no the infra infrared heat, uh, heating project, project. That's what you're working on right now. Yes. And uh, can you share <laughs> can one, you <laughs> one of the many things that you do? But that infrared um, uh, heating project, what does that entail? Oh, yes. Uh, this, this is one of the eight uh, donut deals we are mm. working on, but this is uh, qu uh, quite new. It, uh, it started when uh, the war came, the Ukraine uh, war or the Putin war, how you want to call it. 
And it was just after Corona, and we were uh, uh, rather glad after Corona, because we, we saw that Corona gave a huge uh, uh, yeah, uh, problem between uh, the, all, the, all the citizens in our neighborhood. And so we thought this is the moment we can, uh, we can uh, come together again. And then war came, and then we thought, oh, oh what now? And uh, then we started with a solidarity uh, campaign. We thought, okay, how can we uh, um, minimize our gas uh, use with 15 persons so we can stop with Russian gas? And then we thought, okay, we can do this by uh, changing our uh, way of uh, heating, uh, going from uh, fossil gas to electricity by uh, uh, infrared. Panel. It's a panel uh, uh, on your ceiling, and then it heats uh, the local place here, the table or the, the sitting bank or whatever. And then we thought, yeah, this is nice to be solidar with uh, Ukraine, but how can we also have solidarity with the people in our neighborhood that are more uh, poor in fi financial sentence? Mm -hmm. So we came to the solution, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, offer an infrared pan panel, uh, not 850 euro, but 750 euro. So that's cheaper than normal, but we have more. Uh, you can also make possible that uh, one people in the neighborhood can also get an infrared panel, a cheaper one, but they can get it. Uh, and what they have to do for it is that they give their hands and their heart in activities in our uh, cooperative. Mm -hmm. So everybody's happy. Yeah, so if you purchase uh, for, for 750 uh, euros uh, an infrared panel, somebody else will get one not for, for 150. Free, for 150, and they have to uh, support the co cooperative as well. Yes. Yes. Uh, what is your response to that? Because we saw you starring in that film. <laughs> Where's the cake? Where's the cake? Where's the cake? Yeah, you, you'll come to us uh, next Tuesday, and then we have many oh, cakes okay, because cake. we have eight new deals. We will all be Fine. there next Tuesday. Yes, yes. But, but, but okay, what's your response nice. to that? Well, th uh, this is one of many examples that Anna created, calling them the donut deals. I really, really like this project because is what I think works about the donut as a concept is that it takes a very, very complex world of human rights and ecological planetary boundaries and draws them into one diagram. And I know that's why people say, I get that. It's one picture. What Anne's done is said, OK, now let, let's take that a step further. If you've got a project that's, what, what is it? It's, it's doing three things on the inside, doing three things on the social income and mm -hmm. gender equality and political voice. If it's helping three weeks and it's helping us come back within planetary boundaries, we'll call it a donut deal. And the one you just described is one of them. Mm. I've never heard of infrared panels on the ceiling before. And was telling me over supper earlier. So I think it's great because it's very, very tangible. It takes something that's about planetary boundaries and all human rights to look in this neighborhood, if you buy a panel, Somebody else can get one at a discounted price. They can volunteer in the commons in this community organization. Mm. So it's bringing together something at a very tangible level in a neighborhood that we understand. And it's never going to look exactly like that in another neighborhood, mm. right? It's going to be designed according to each local community, but it's the principles yeah. of it. But I think it's, I think it's a really smart way of helping people think, ah, I'm bringing together, and I'm designing in as many benefits as I can. That's what I like about it as well. Can what I be a spoil be? sport Go as on well? <laughs> because uh, you, you're getting off the gas as well. But if you look at the carbon footprint, creating two panels using electricity, how does that fit in, or shouldn't it always fit in in that sense? Because it's creating a huge carbon footprint, isn't it? I don't know if it oh, is. No. I think it's a big. Oh, go on. I, I, I'll just. I'll say quickly one thing, and then we need to come with the appropriate technology solution. So, mm. what kind of energy we should be generating depends on each context and what the options are. And I'm going to bet that Anne has done her research. <laughs> I yes, bet she yeah, did. Because of course, the footprint is uh, quite uh, important. Uh, so we uh, made uh, our uh, our uh, good, uh, research work, and. Um, it's better. It's better in terms of ecological footprint. Of course, it takes some electricity, 
but uh, the gas is much lower. And um, we need to educate the people who use this uh, infrared panel mm. because it's so nice. So you can think we, we keep the, the gas high and the infrared panel, <laughs> <laughs> then, then you have a problem. Mm. But we have experienced it. Uh, I have uh, I've experienced it myself and also my neighbors. And they could tell about this. And we have a film about that. And so other people know how they have to handle it. Mm. So it's better for the footprint. It's better for the energy bill. It's for everybody. It's better for everybody. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, now, uh, um, um, you've been working on EcoStrom. Yes, that's correct. Tell me more about it. And you have to move a little bit closer to the microphone so okay, people at home okay, can yes. hear you I, as well. I'm a, I'm a well-known speaker, so uh, that's, I think uh, I should uh, try to relax. Do we have my... F uh, this is the last picture, I guess. I can't start with the last picture. This is the first picture because yesterday we get the proof of the practice, which I longed for a very long time. And I'm going to tell you from the end of the story why uh, this was this is a, such an important picture because yesterday we had an opening of a mixed uh, owner uh, households uh, ownership of tv did, did, did i say pronounce it mm -hmm. right because Fokker helped me today with this ter terms this is a mixed uh, householder ownership and there is the uh, the wethouder and uh, she, she said, yeah, I, 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 two weeks ago, I got very angry because I said we were in a, in a meeting of getting from the gas and there were 150 people from the city of Amsterdam and no housing corporations were there. And I said, I'm, now I'm really angry because people always say to me, you're getting only the people who profit from their uh, big wallet and you have the green energy. I said, no, I'm Every day I say, I want to help you, household and corporation, but you don't want my help. But yesterday we got there, we opened a mixed owner household uh, project. Can you get, get the next picture, just please? These are the, the, uh, the households and the people, it's very important for the people. And there's also, by coincidence, because I, he I heard that history is written by coincidence, a week before I was called by the Rabobank, the cooperated bank, you won a prize. I said, okay, that's very good, because in one afternoon I, I tried to apply because I had many roofs, and I applied one of that, this theater, Theater Frascati. I said, okay, I'm going to join this theater and see where, where we get. And two weeks ago they, they phoned me and said, you won. I said, okay. So I do, I do have an opening, so maybe you can join us, and we all be together. And the picture again, can you get back to the first picture? We were there because we were opening the project which social housing uh, tenants and owners were together in a project. And uh, there's also banks, so we can, I think we can fund this. We now have a new system, this um, subsidy for cooperative energy. So we can also very good fund these projects. And I said, now we can make them all come together. These tenants, these house owners, mm -hmm. we have the money, we have the politics going on, and we have this big picture of proof. <laughs> so I know, and now I know I can do it. And nobody <laughs> can say you can do it anymore. <laughs> so, yes. I'm very happy that things yeah. are going so well because what the corporation actually does is got more than 1,500 members yes. and uh, they all can invest in, 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 in solar energy, yes. I understand. Yeah. And even if, you, if you're renting and you don't yeah. have accessibility yeah. to your own roof or you can't invest in your own uh, solar panels or in your own home, it's possible to do invest in that and to, to, to collaborate together. Yes. And um, um, uh, how... Was it difficult? Why, why is, it, is it important to have that shared um, um, responsibility in regards to EcoStorm, in regard to the solar panels? Uh, yes, we are going from the central uh, energy to this decentral energy. Mm. And that, that needs involvement of everybody, because uh, I think it's a very good uh, example of this infrared panels, which I think is very good. Because I hear these big terms, we need to get off the gas. Mm -hmm. that, that's very far away when you're a tenant with a small wallet. Mm -hmm. And I always say, so, solar panels is the first step because it's not behind your front door. You can now easily join because they're funded. And you can watch it. I don't know <laughs> if it's a private or not, and what's the, uh, the, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the big deal about AVG. But you can follow your own... Uh, 
yeah, your own profit yeah. on your telephone. So it's a very small step, but for tenants, for social tenants, is still a very big step. And if, and I, I told two weeks ago where the social uh, co corporations of housing were not there, when you want to get off the gas and you have very big words, you're not going to make it if you're not going to get solar done. Mm. And they're not getting it done. They don't, work with, they don't want to work with me. Mm. Yesterday they did. So we need to work together to get there. Yeah. And there, there is no change because we have to, um, we have to do this. And we're going to this, this decentral... Uh, uh, energy system, so everybody needs to join because they want us to join. So we we need we need some we, we need to organize ourselves, otherwise it won't happen. And that that's why why it's it's, it's happening. Great. We, yeah, and it's it's very very difficult. And I think it's also it's uh, one of what I think is important is skill. When you have nothing, I always learned from the Socialistic Party, which I'm not a member of. Is that when you don't have uh, anything, you can't exchange anything. So you need something to exchange things. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's the first step. So you yeah. need to make some skill. And I'm from a real estate uh, background, so I first said I have to make projects before I can exchange things. <laughs> now we're in a position that we are coming there. Yeah. It took, I think, seven years to get here. Yeah, and, and that's amazing and inspiring yeah. to hear as well. Anna, if you if you have, would we ask you as well for an advice for the new coalition? What is that advice? Oh yeah, uh, my advice is that we come to a big donor deal with uh, the, the, the whole municipality because we have now smaller donor deals with uh, the municipality at the level of, uh, of southeast. But in fact, we, what we are saying is that there is not a top down only, there is not only a bottom up, but we have to, to meet each other and then go into uh, equality and say what are our common problems, our common tasks mm. here, and uh, what can you do, and what, what can we do? And if we come to a big uh, donut deal uh, together as a uh, municipality and the cooperatives in Amsterdam, then we have a beautiful donut deal. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Is there anything you would like to comment on, on, uh, on, on the advice? No, I, I think... Uh, well, I, oh, sorry. No, I'm... Um, now it's a sticker, but now I have to bring this one here. Um, now, what, what, what I like about... Because you, you're all saying um, the, the future of energy is well distributed or decentralized. And I think this is, this is the opportunity we have as well, to be less depending on central big companies that provide us. So instead... And it's strange that, that we not all see this opportunity, that instead of being... Uh, so, so a lot of the, like, if you think about top down, we, 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 we will organize it as we did. A, a big provider which tell, helps us to, to, and we solve it for the citizens. And I think what the, the opportunity is that actually we can have more ownership mm -hmm. and we have more agency in how we organize our energy uh, production as well and also consumption. So this, and the, one of the terms that's being used is the internet of energy. Mm. is that you can have a distributed energy system which has a, a different layers, of course, and different a backbone, but also a lot of opportunity for people to participate, to become part of the solution instead of just being a consumer waiting for somebody yeah. to, uh, mm. to, to, to do it for them. Yeah. And what I really like about your story is that normally it's saying, well, maybe the people that own houses will be actively, like the, the happy few will do it, mm. and you come with tenants and, and structures that, that also enables people that have not less to spend but still be part of, and of, I think your story is really beautiful. So this can be like a community effort as well. And, and then you have so much more than only a new energy transition, and you have empowerment, you have more social cohesion. There are so many things that people can do together at the moment that you find each other. So I think, I, I, like, I love it what you're t telling us. And I think this, the, the, the empowerment and ownership then goes hands in hand. Yeah. Norge, what would your advice be to the new government? Um, yeah, a uh, small introduction. I very recognize this problem about this public-private uh, uh, association and not being civil citizens being in between. And I was here before the, that uh, when it was discussed that uh, the government it's, think it's very difficult to deal with us because we're not poor citizens who, who can't arrange their own things and we can, they can help us because they like to help people. And uh, we, but we can uh, do our own thing. And we're strong enough, Anna and me. And, uh, but we're also not a big company, so we're, we're not uh, the, the, the party who, who, can, who can tell them, um, 
yeah, we have to do this and then we can get there. So we're something in between. And there, I think that's needs a bigger definition. Uh, so they know who is who are you? You know, that's that's the, that's the first question. Who are who am I dealing with? And uh, what what is the big the donor deal we're we're getting together in? Mm -hmm. So that's very very difficult for the government uh, to to recognize us. So yeah, can I say right. a little thing about that? Because I've I've been uh, from another position and waar het was the overleg over fysieke leefomgeving. I don't know how to explain that. Um, uh, so, but we had this official role to look into how this uh, program Aardgasvrije Wijken, how that was developing. And we looked at participation. And in the end, it, was, it started with, uh, well, participation is that we will go to the citizens and we will tell them, we will in, we'll inform them. And then maybe we'll... And then it was clear that well, civic society is much faster in some ways. And then you have the energy corporations that people want to do this. So in the end, the, we, we advised to the ministry um, that they would the new money for the climate table will be spent also on uh, civic initiatives. So not just so there will, what I hope now that what will happen is that both the like and the, this this term is then the third way that the derde weg. Mm -hmm. So there's there's the way the, the energy transition cannot come from. Of course, the government can come from private parties and come from civic society. And this third way needs to have a learning uh, money to learn together. Uh, money to spend to, to, to build up your, your, your presence, uh, funding for the organization, and hopefully the next program will fulfill that partly. Mm -hmm. And this is something I know that Pauline is sitting there from 02025, and she's been advocating this for years. And hopefully this will happen in the next uh, next round of funding for, for the tr energy transition. But one, co one comment on that, yes. because energy transition is one, but for us in, in uh, Amsterdam Southeast, it's important to start with the social transition yeah. Yeah. and then the democratic transition. Because if we only look at energy transition, it yeah. could be a middle class uh, yeah. white uh, play, playing game. Yeah. So for us, it's important to start with the social transition, then the democratic transition, and then the energetic Clear. transition. And there's a final okay, remark because we're entering the final minutes of our conversation. Uh, my, my advice is create a level playing field and uh, get all the, par uh, the parties funded uh, equally. Because I think what, what, what the, thing, uh, the thing is, I really hate it that the social housing corporations got money uh, to uh, put so solar panels on the roofs, mm -hmm. and my business model is better for their uh, for their tenants. And but uh, the, the main thing is they're doing not all the roofs there because they're not getting there. So I think it's it's I can't imagine this that you give people money and they don't deliver. Mm. That should stop tomorrow. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. I should yeah. be very watchful for that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Kate, is there anything you would like to add to this conversation or anything that you heard that you would like to, uh, to pay a focus on as well? I'm just blown away by the, the people coming to the stage, and I know there are more coming, who have so much vision, mm -hmm. determination, guts, and <laughs> persistence. And thank, you know, kudos to citizens, to, to civic members who do that, because it takes seven years, it takes years and years, and then we get these results. So I just want to acknowledge that it takes a certain kind of person who is dogged and determined and makes stuff happen. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Noortje yes, Verkleef. Yeah. And on the cycle. <laughs> The final round of this conversation will entail um, uh, redesigning the ownership of land. And I would like to invite Sasha Glassel and Leongo Juliana to the table. And Leongo Juliana is a very familiar face here as well. He was one of the Designing Cities for All Fellows. And uh, he's an architect and director at Leongo Architecture. A warm welcome to you. Please give them him a warm hand. And Sasha Glasel is, uh, is uh, an architect and a researcher and co-founder of Space and Matter. A warm welcome to you as well. Please give him a <laughs> Sasha, I would like to start with you because you're one of the founders of Space and Matter. And for the people who do not know you or Space and Matter, what is it? Like I'm, I'm for, uh, what do you say? Like I'm a trained architect. Uh, together with two partners, Sheard and Matai, we started 13 years ago our company. And um, we started as an architecture firm, but we pretty fast figured out that architects were really not in charge of making cities anymore. 
but uh, they really have a good um, like ethic. Mm -hmm. I think more than uh, a lot of other people who shape the cities. And we took kind of the responsibility to uh, be basically uh, work within the planetary boundaries on the one hand, but then do also a lot of community-led projects. Mm. And that's what we did like the last 12, 13 years. Uh, we realized a lot of projects for the people from Amsterdam, the Keuvels, Ron Schip, we were involved. Here you see our beautiful like, uh, um, dream project, basically, this is the Keuvel. Yeah. So this is what we did basically in the last... And the Keuvel is, is, is a, space, a place in Amsterdam North where there, there, there was a cafe there as well, but it was also built, it was a, a soiled ground and it was also built to have a regenerative uh, idea of yes. cleaning the ground, right? Yes, so basically, I mean, we, uh, I think we were pretty much working within the donut from the beginning, but since we read your book, Kate, we pretty much could tell better what our vision and mission was. Mm -hmm. We, st we stuck for a long, long time like, uh, to circularity, and uh, the principles of the circularity has a very strong foundation in also the social part. Mm -hmm. But I think the donut tells so beautiful like, that there's really the balance between the planetary boundaries and the social foundation. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, often when we talk about circularity, it's a very technical, technical discussion, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are left behind. And, and also, I think the Keuvel was a project where we managed also a very, very, very diverse uh, community to realize this project. But a lot of other like housing projects we did, which were community-led, uh, were projects where highly educated people were involved. Yeah. And they had backgrounds in real estate, architecture. And for them, it was not a piece of cake to realize these projects, but a little bit easier. Uh, and we learned from all these projects a lot. And now we are aiming basically for the next step. So how can you... Uh, make and develop projects in a neighborhood or an area scale really within the donut and uh, make them really inclusive. Yeah. And that's very challenging and we figured out that land ownership is key uh, to this, uh, at least to the opportunity to experiment on that. Because you've been working on community land trusts, yeah. what is that? So the community, community land trust is um, it's a very interesting model which is uh, exercised in the US, in the UK, Belgium already, it, it kind of swapped over to Europe uh, um, since a couple of years. And it, what it basically does, it's, um, it's uh, when I think r real estate development is quite a complex uh, industry, right? A lot of people, are, basically nobody knows how that really works. Yeah. People only see, uh, I cannot pay an apartment, I cannot afford an apartment anymore, mm -hmm. right? And the whole system behind this uh, uh, unaffordability lays not only in building costs, but also in land ownership, mm. right? So the community land trust offers, on the one hand, the separation between land and the buildings on top. So it puts the land ownership in the hands of a tripartite between the public sector, mm -hmm. the community which will use the land, mm -hmm. and the neighborhood around this land. And basically, they safeguard the vision on long term what happens there. On an equal share? Yes, on one third share mm. each. And that is a model which was, is proven, uh, brings a lot of long term uh, goals and, and protects a lot of long term goals into uh, real estate development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, is that sustainable? Because every group that you described in mm. that trifecta almost, uh, has got their own goals and uh, got their own needs. How do you make sure that it's well balanced? Yeah, I think then it's exactly like uh, we talked about purpose, right? You should meet, not, you probably cannot uh, project this model on every location, mm -hmm. right? But I think uh, it's not yet very exercised in the Netherlands and it offers the opportunity for the three parties when they share the same purpose mm -hmm. to work on the same goals. But, but that, 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 that's key. They have to yes. share the same purpose. Yes, totally. And I can I, I could understand that. You know, the, the municipality, the neighbourhood, and you know, the inhabitants of that piece right. of lands. Um, you know, that sometimes the, 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 it, it will clash. Yeah. But often now, I think the, the municipality takes the responsibility, the difficult responsibility, to basically translate all the needs of all the other parties yeah. and safeguard that. And I think Amsterdam has a has a system, the ground lease system, in order to yeah. not give away all the power and control mm -hmm. forever, but keeps control and can re-evaluate mm -hmm. also. 
And I think that's a good base for adding it uh, to a CLT model. Yeah. And that CLT model, model, is that already applied in Amsterdam? It, there's, first, uh, uh, there's a first approach also in the south uh, east of Amsterdam to, to uh, exercise it, mm -hmm. but not to its full extent. Mm -hmm. And we now try basically to bring the curve because the ground lease contract will end over one and a half year. Yeah. It was a 10 year ground lease contract. Yeah. We try to put that now into a CLT and we fight for and also advocate that that is the right thing to do. And how does the city respond to that? The discussion started, <laughs> but I hope, and I, I'm, I'm very hopeful with the, with the results of the election, mm. because I think the parties which were elected, it's pretty much, uh, I think they both, the parties in, in charge, I think they can safeguard exactly the boundaries, both boundaries of the donut, mm. right? There's a very strong tendency, of course, towards uh, democratization on the one hand, and on the other hand, of course, uh, Groen Links uh, protecting uh, the planetary boundaries. Yeah, yeah. Leongo, uh, uh, what is your response to that CLT? Because I know that you're an architect with a very specific vision on how the city should be developed and who has a seat at the table. Is our CLTs the way to go forward. Can I ask you something practical first? Can I have a glass? No, uh, we will make sure you will have a glass. I, th I thought you would swig it from the bottle like that. <laughs> I, I would normally do, but uh, I try to behave here at the table. Uh, <laughs> we will arrange that. Um, well, there, there, there's many things that were, were said, and, and, and well, I can react on the CLT. I think what, you know, um, um, Sasha just said that, that um, real estate is a very complex industry. And I, I agree, but, but I would like to add that we made real estate a very complex industry. Mm -hmm. Because in most parts of the world, it's very simple. When you want a house, you build a house. Mm -hmm. And now we have created a so complex system, and we are expecting that this system that created the problem is going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and that is one of my worries. And my other worry is what I've added all the time is if I look at this audience and I, if I look at um, the, how the, the city of Amsterdam is composed, I don't see the people represented. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that, that we can change that. And what's because the fundament of that, of, that, of that problem, actually? Why? We, um, because we, we, we are missing a big group mm -hmm. uh, in, in intellectual capacity in a way of thinking. It, this, it, within this group, you have a lot of survivors mm -hmm. that have survived maybe moving from a different culture, moving here, finding a way to, to, to keep going and are very adaptive to the system. Thank you so much. Um, um, and we don't include them. And I think a lot of the answers to the challenges that we have now will come from those groups. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I find that it's a big, big pity, and that is a, one of the biggest challenges that we have within this city, is that we are continuously excluding certain groups and keep discussing within the bubble. Mm. And that's the feeling I had sitting there, listening and listening, and I was, okay, everybody was very happy with each other, which is good, you have to stimulate each other, but we have this big challenge, how do we reach the rest, the other, 56% of the society. And how do you do that? Because I don't think anybody's not willing it, in order to do that, but one, how do you do that? One step is by realizing it, realizing mm. the fact, I mean, you will be surprised how many people living in Amsterdam don't realize that 56% of, pe of the people living in Amsterdam have a migration background. Mm -hmm. And that is not something new, mm -hmm. that is something that has been decayed the, the case for decades already, not only decades, for centuries. Mm -hmm. You know, the golden era, Amsterdam consisted of 40% people with a migration background. Yeah. We celebrate the golden era, but we don't t talk about that part yeah. and man many other parts also of that era. But that, th those are my biggest worries. But, but still, I, I think it's good to have that, you know, that, that realization that people are not being represented, people on voices aren't being heard at the table. Now the next step forward is how to go about it, because what we hear about the energy cooperative, for example, is that people are being heard or given the opportunity to participate. Is, is that enough or how should we, if we talk about redesigning, if we talk about ownership, how should you spread that? How should you share that ownership? You would, you would have to start with what I said already, realize 
who all should be at the table, mm -hmm. what all should be represented, and then make sure that you include everyone in your solution mm -hmm. and not just solution within your um, uh, academic mm -hmm. bubble, but solutions that are also f feasible for people uh, for, that have a different background mm -hmm. in that sense, a different academic background or a yeah. less academic background. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're not reaching that, the, the, the complete society, how are you gonna go about that an energy transition? And that's why I like the comment of the, the lady that was sitting at my space yeah. uh, before, yeah. that you have to start with a social transition first. And a democratic transition. I, I will, uh, yeah. but if I, the, the land ownership in Southeast is, is coming from people with a migration background, isn't it? I think that to, 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 me, that, to me it was remarkable saying like, wow, they're doing it. What is your I, response yeah. to that? Yeah, I also wanted to like add to this. I think in general, I mean, the city is busy with. They made this like Umgebungsvisie, uh, like the vision for for basically the, the the city again, a new a new vision. One part of it, one chapter, is like this uh, making city together, right? And and I think the city is really busy uh, also finding different ways of how to make city again together. And I'm, I'm also, I see in, in, in practice that it's not easy, right? It's like, how do you reach out to people? In general, I think we have to experiment a lot more, right? We have to put a lot of more attention in also hearing people. But then, on the other hand, when I see in real estate uh, development and land ownership, like the moment you own land, you have position and you are heard, right? You are invited and you can, which was also said before, you can negotiate. But in the moment you have an own land, you ha you're a party, you are like a representative of something, mm. uh, or of this place at least. And I think uh, a lot of people, not only in the city, they don't own land. So they have to really fight hard for seven, eight years to be recognized, right? And, and I think there's something maybe we should shift in this paradigm, mm. where maybe we should start with uh, not that you have to, uh, that you can pay and that you can buy ownership, but maybe you should earn ownership also and lend ownership. Once you own it, you are also a party and a representative of this place. Right? If you live in a neighborhood and you do work in the neighborhood and you start an initiative, that should be already probably uh, uh, allow you to earn mm. land. Uh, Kate, right? if I would like to ask you, um, is this the way to go forward? Is Because what I hear, I understand what you're saying. Maybe I do agree even, but still you keep that old system in place. Ownership means influence. And if I hear you correctly, we sh shouldn't we get rid of that, those systems where ownership means influence? Oh, and I think, but I think everybody here is opening up and challenging what ownership means and making it, first of all, more collective. So how can we have not private individual family inherited ownership, mm. but cooperative ownership or commons ownership. And it will bring voice, but I mean, I think it goes deeper. Do we want people to own the land or yeah. do you keep the, the ground lease? I have very few Dutch words, but I can say Urfpacht. <laughs> I know that matters in this city and that it how does. land is held in this city is, is an advantage over other cities that have just privatized the land and it's just held and then agglomerated in, in few hands. But I think there are really great questions about do we want to move away from just the concept of ownership to stewardship? Mm -hmm. So we are, we are stewards of this land for a period of time as opposed to its long-term owners who determine it, what happens to it. But I think this whole conversation, we're redesigning ownership, but in the process we may actually redesign beyond ownership towards stewardship. We're and saying goodbye to ownership in order to recognize stewardship as well, and that gives a responsibility. Yeah, and, and it probably won't be goodbye to ownership. It's more like, let's have a multiplicity mm. of ways that we recognize, if we want to go deeper, our relationship to the living world. Yeah. And stop claiming to own things. Do you own a dog? What do you mean, do I own a dog? You can't own a dog. Do you, you, know, you have a dog as a member of your household yeah. and family. You don't own it. So if we can move away from thinking we own our pets, yeah. do we own the land? Do we own the resources? Do we own the natural systems? So I think we're actually in an era where we're going to find the language, find new form, legal forms, but new language that actually 
helps us recognize we've got to move away from thinking we own and possess everything. And that's, that's, that, and that's connected to a long-term vision as well. And uh, somebody very familiar to, to you, Roman Chris and Eric, wrote uh, uh, also about ownership, that if we shouldn't focus now on, um, uh, on owning things or having, creating for the good of the moment now, but being a good ancestor. So generations after us should benefit from the land and from the world as well. And that's been considered good stewardship as well, right? Yeah, so that, that is, again, seeing ourselves, how can, how can I own something? I am temporary. Mm -hmm. I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And yet the land or the trees that I think I own are going to persist for maybe centuries beyond me. So what would that mean that I claim I own it? If we take the longer term view and we talk about stewardship, yeah. we see ourselves as actually temporary beings on a much longer planet. And of course, the nice surprise is that Roman Krasnarek is here tonight. Exactly. So <laughs> Somewhere in the audience out there, author in, of The Good Ancestor. In, in a moment. He'll have something to add. In a moment, we'll, we'll go to Roman Krasnarek as well. But I would like to finish this stage off with the advice that you have to the new local government. What advice did you formulate for that new local government? Yeah, I think um, we need more space for experimentation, right? I think we don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. I think, and, and the difficult part where we are in is now that we are in a transition between uh, people, now land is owned, but mm -hmm. there's not any piece of land which is not owned by somebody, yeah. right, or a collective. So I think b the idea also of the CLT model is that you, that you take land out of this speculative market, yeah. put it in a vault, and, and then uh, organize a stewardship model, yeah. that tra transition, I think, is needed. But in that case, you have to experiment on that, mm -hmm. right? And we only will know it if we experiment and learn and, and, and measure, may, probably. So I think, uh, and I, I would really like to uh, uh, encourage the, the municipality to experiment more on these new development models and take land out of the speculative market. Right especially when infl inflation hits yeah. and everyone runs to land more than a gold rush, it's a land rush. Yeah. So I think right then you have to have this counter movement. Right, thank you so much. Can I, can I jump in with one more comment? Because I want to come back to what Leonga was saying, yeah. which I think is so important. I can't speak on the detail of the city of Amsterdam, but I do know that in the US, the city of Atlanta has three times more um, enterprises owned by African Americans than any other city anywhere nearby. Yeah. And that's not just coincidence. That's because the city said, realized who owns the sources of wealth creation mm -hmm. has huge implications on distribution, on counterbalancing historic racism, mm -hmm. on equity, you know, bringing greater equity in our society. And so they invest in supporting those entrepreneurs, in enabling those businesses to thrive. So if, if we care about a wider conversation and wider forms of ownership, the city needs to say, we are actively going to get involved and we want to ensure that those communities who have been historically marginalized actually become at the frontier of this new ownership movement. And I, I also, I, I understand from previous events here, it is in, indeed in the South, is it de Varen? I, I, I won't try and put no. Yeah, the, the, where, where it's happening, the Community Land Trust I've heard of, it is indeed from a far more mm. diverse community yeah. who are leading that. Come back to peer-to-peer -peer inspiration. If and when that succeeds and that is seen widely, then take that and say, now let's take this into all these other neighborhoods and let yeah. that leadership happen and that inspiration happen. That could really be something transformative in the city. Right. Uh, Leongo, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear your advice as well, but um, I also understand that it's not only about cultural or ethnical background as well, it's also about class, it's also about marginalised groups. So it's, it's a holistic view on p giving people a voice or having people ha have a seat at the table, right? Uh, and, and we have to realise as, as a people that um, don't get paralyzed by the system you know, about owning land. You know what happens in, in many other countries when, you need, when, when people don't own the land, they claim the land. Mm. And so if we have a housing crisis, if it's really a crisis that we have, start claiming it. <laughs> oh, right. Really, because if, 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 if it is a crisis, mm. what happens if, if you are in Colombia or in, in Medellin, people move to the city to find a better way of life and they claim a piece of land and then they live there. Right. So right. if we have a real crisis, start claiming your position. Uh, and that's one thing I wanted to add. And the other one is look at our hip-hop scene of the Dutch hip-hop and, and look 
at, at the amount of streams that these girls and guys are, are, are getting, or these women and men are getting. Mm. And we are still talking about Dutch music and not including the hip hop scene as being Dutch music, but they, they are the strongest striving Dutch music at this moment. Mm. The same goes for fashion design. Mm. Who are the biggest fashion designers now coming from the Netherlands? They didn't go through the system. Mm -hmm. So we should ask ourselves, how is it possible that our system where we invest so much in education, but our best are not coming through that. Mm. Right, so it's about broadening perspectives, realizing that there are alternatives and moving away from traditional systems. M making use of the talent that you have. Mm. Yeah, and whether it be squatting or just fashion design, making use by any means necessary. Yes. All right, thank you so much, Leongo. Thank you so much, Sasha. Please give them a warm hand. We've come to the final stage of this program, and I would like to have like a short reflection with you, and then to give it uh, to, to open it up to the public. But uh, I'm willing to blindside somebody. Roman Krasnara, can I invite you to the table here to give us a <laughs> short, a short uh, to, to, to pose a couple of questions to you? Because um, um, I, I wonder how you've been listening to this evening here, and what your response is. Please give a warm hand to Roman Krasnara. I wasn't actually expecting this. I know, that's why I said blindsiding. I haven't blind actually speak live for about three years, <laughs> COVID and so on. So uh, right. I was just enjoying myself sitting back, but yes. I know, just a little bit of background. We, we, we I interviewed you in Bakhuizweger when COVID was hitting immensely and we were in a lockdown, but still it was very inspiring. And it was about talking about stewardship, I was talking about uh, uh, other systems. What we do now is we focus on the now. We focus on the problems now and on the systems that are not functioning at the moment. But we don't take uh, um, the future in regard. Can you help us in order to broaden that perspective and why is it necessary to develop the world as we live in now with the future in mind? Well, one of the most striking things to me when I was listening to everything was not hearing anything about indigenous cultures being mentioned. Because when you're talking about ownership and shifting from ideas of ownership to stewardship, of course, a lot of the models we find are not just in you know, legal complexities of land trust, but in ideas of seventh generation decision making found in many indigenous communities making decisions based on looking how we're gonna impact on future generations. And of course, that's embedded in um, legal frameworks, you know, in Canada, for example, there's whole bodies of indigenous law, and I don't know, but maybe there's interesting things to, to learn from there, and that's all about, exactly as Kate was talking about, well, here we have a planet that we are temporarily here for, for an eye blink in the moment of the great cosmic story, but we're not going to be here forever. Um, we pass it on to the next generations. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's something there to learn from indigenous culture, potentially. But, but how can you make people here and, and lawmakers here realize that indigenous culture, when it's not you know, rooted in the Netherlands, that it, that is of value within our own society? I mean, it's hard, isn't it? Because those societies seem so different from the one here, you know, the one well, that I- Well, that being called actually underdeveloped, quote unquote. Yeah, I think, well, partly I, I love examples where there's thinking, and I think we actually we spoke about this, um, you know, some, when we spoke some months ago, uh, and I was talking about this movement in Japan called Future Design, mm. where they've taken this idea of seventh generation decision making from uh, Native American culture, and they invite local people to discuss and draw up plans for the towns and cities where they live. Yeah. Um, like a forum like this, and they split people into two groups, and half of you are told your residents from today, and half of you are given these beautiful, like, kimono-like robes to wear, and told to imagine yourselves as residents from the year 2060. Okay, so 40 years in the future. It turns out that those residents in the kimonos um, are much more transformative in their thinking about how to deal with exactly the questions you're talking about, about mm. Uh, redistributive energy and about rethinking the digital commons and all that kind of stuff. So that's, and they're inspired directly by this Native American idea, but they're doing it in big cities like Kyoto mm. or in companies like Fujitsu, even in Japan's Ministry of Finance. Mm. Um, I've been having meetings with the governors of Japanese prefectures, regions, about exactly this. So, you know, it's not crazy stuff, it's being put into practice. Right. 
And, and um, well, we could all talk all, all night, but 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 it's good to, to 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 hear that now, and that's what Sasha's plea was as well to have, make room for more experiment and even experiment that may be rooted in other societies that not Dutch or even European. Thank you so much for now, Chris. Roman, Chris, and Eric. But please stop, just stay seated, <laughs> because we would so like. So surely to... there are other people who should. <laughs> <laughs> please give, give me a hand. Um, uh, over to 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 Marlene and Kate. Um, um, we've entered the final stage before we open it up to the public. Um, what is your biggest takeaway from tonight? What is, what, you've been listening. What, what's your biggest takeaway? The, the, the importance, and I, it's what I said before, is the importance of the conviction of individuals who mm. want to make things happen, that the system is not trying to already make things happen. Mm. And you can feel it. You can feel the force of personality. Yeah. And that doggedness, which means that somebody is willing to keep going and going and going and, and to bring together the, the parties to, to make that legal partnership signing happen, it's not just going to arise. It takes people and working together to, to counter those rules and ways of practice that are in place. But also just... I do, I feel it from the many examples that we heard that have just been signed or on the cusp, but just beginning. This is the beginning of a, a new municipal government here for the next four years. These examples, I know Anne and in their community, they're about to open a biogas digester mm. in the next five to six weeks. Imagine what when other people from, from neighbourhoods in this city can go and see that this is the lid, you lift it up, it takes 50 kilograms a day, this is how you put it. Oh, look, it goes in a home. It becomes real. Yeah. These technologies that we've never quite seen, it becomes real and it becomes possible. So I'm going to be watching this city over the next mm. four years to see how the peer-to-peer -peer inspiration from each of these examples and from the community land trusts mm. actually ripples out. And then the question is, and what is the city government, the municipality, as the public side of that relationship, what is it going to do differently, do additionally, and understanding, and I really like the point about, you know, who are we? Who, how do they understand who you're dealing with? You're not the poor citizens who need help, mm. and you're not the companies you shake hands with. We are, we are organised citizens, and we move faster than the government sometimes. Collaborate with us, enable us. So there's a really interesting transformation of understanding of roles going on. Yeah. Uh, that, that's such an eye-opener for me tonight as well. So we shouldn't be dismissive of small-scale initiatives, to, of, of the small things happening in neighbourhoods, but that should be an inspiration just to, 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 to break the system, maybe. And the, the, the change is coming from the people in that sense. Yeah, because the, because the 20th century, I think, was dominated by big technologies, oil rigs, gas pipelines, that needed big capital to come together with a big factory. And that means you need big system. Yeah. The beauty of energy and digital that we have now is that it's begging to be distributed by design. It's begging to be a few solar panels on this rooftop and that one dotted across the landscape, wind turbines, and mm. that means that they can be owned by housing cooperatives, by schools, by households. And the digital technologies mean we can, you know, you, you're connected to the world right here. <laughs> So it's come down to the household scale yeah. and that transforms everything. And if, you know, through Marlene's work, if we can create the stack of design that enables that, it is transformative. We don't need scale, we need spread. Yeah. And that means one biogas digester in a neighborhood is the source of zillions of biogas digesters in neighborhoods owned by many, many, many different groups. Yeah. So moving from the 20th century scale to the 21st century spread, the technologies are asking for it, we need to design to enable that to happen. Great. Elaine, what's your biggest takeaway from tonight? We're all the same. <laughs> <laughs> what she said. What she said, yeah. Um, well, um, the, the, I think Oh my God! I want to be very optimistic and and say this is this is a dawn like a, of mm. a, a new age, uh, like uh, <laughs> David Graebner and so on. Uh, we have a new narrative, uh, cooperation, civic society. Uh, but I also, I, there, and this and it's spreading, not scaling. It's not the big stories. It's the it's the distributed one. So I think we all are already building this language and this narrative and 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 trying to understand our, ourselves in in an other capacity that we can do different that that we can do it uh, and at the same time there are so many really 
big issues. And I, there's a sort of like there's also a very problematic situation that the technologies are at the moment dominated by big tech, yeah. and 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 so they have they are distributed by nature, but they're best centralized because of the power structures, because of the money structures, because of how banks are operating, how investment companies are, in, how they uh, like the land grab and the technology grab, and so it's it's like it's it's like it's sometimes I feel like it's there there's two powers mm. at the same time. Right. We're at war yeah. because we try to get less depending on oil and gas. Yeah. And then this big oil money comes back into the platforms, the technology platforms, because mm. they try to keep their power. So it's, 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 I think there's a cultural war. Mm -hmm. there is this, there is, it's, it's also a, a real fight. Yeah. It's not just, we can't just take it for granted that, that this, this power that has been uh, presented to us, and I believe in it a lot, but really governments really have to understand it really fast because otherwise they will lock being locked in and, and we lose out on, on what the potential of civic society is. And I, I believe in this civic society yeah. and civic action. Right. So I also feel a bit like, um, like hmm, we have to be fast yeah. in this. To move along. Yeah. And, and to, to, to build this kind of civ civic action together faster than we, than we, than we realize yeah. to be a more stronger uh, movement. Yeah. I would like to open it up for the audience for a moment for the last uh, uh, final stage of this programme. Are there any questions or ideas uh, from the audience for our guests? Anybody? Yeah, that's one over there. If you've got a moment, the microphone will come to you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the interesting uh, discussion. Um, it's uh, interesting to see the global scale and moving towards the civic community. I mean, at some point you had governments which were struggling, then municipalities took over to, to, to optimize solutions, which you thought that was going to a more sort of community, and now there's even a more micro scale. Don't you see a risk there of also going into sometimes some sub-optimization, like intra-community instead of inter-communities -community within a city? So if you think of shared mobilities within a certain community that's also looking at their own but actually you also have to look at the level of a city which also that's missing the bigger picture because it's not about just having more electric cars with every community which are sub-optimized it's looking at the bigger picture so where do you see that balance going between this uh, going more into from public to civic because civic can go also at very small groups let's ask Kate I think it's a great point we need things that operate at multiple scales and um, whether we're thinking about energy systems or the circular economy and the flow of materials, your point is absolutely right. It's not that we want smallest is best. A circular economy, if we think about the flow of materials, of, of, of plastics, of food waste, of um, timber, it's, it's going to be bigger than just within a neighbourhood, right? Because we're part of much bigger systems and some of them are international. So I think we're actually at the, at the pretty early days. Now we start to think about what will happen to this timber once it's no longer used in a table, for example, and think about this chair and everything. We suddenly are incredibly conscious of materials. We're only just beginning to understand what is the most effective scale, geographic scale, at which this kind of circular economy can be created. Some things will work really well. And for example, the, the community level biogas digester, food waste, get it in a local biogas digester and turn it into gas. That can happen within a few streets. But the reuse of timber and glass and fibers, that's gonna be on a much bigger scale. So I think they're gonna be multi-scales and I, there's no one answer. We need to figure out how do we optimize and make it most effective. So therefore, we need many, many levels, what Ellen Ostrom, again, would have called polycentric governance. It needs to work at the community scale, that needs to co connect with the city district, the municipal and the wider city area, within the country, within the European Union and beyond. So complex flows of material, and again, it requires more interrelations of governance. But I think it's a great point. It doesn't mean that always more local is always best. Right. Thank you so much. Anybody else? That's a, oh, <laughs> there are three questions there. We'll start in the front. Uh, thank you. Uh, so there was this picture in the beginning, uh, which sort of connected the public sector to the commons, which I thought was sort of a prime, sort of a key relation that we need to build on in the city. 
And I think we have uh, seen a lot of people here that we, we, we often call pioneers, like people like, like Sasha here and all of the people like Anne, who are really sort of doing the experiments we're talking about, learning what's needed to go through this transformation, actually showing it, making it tangible. So we have huge groups of people like these active in our city, creating the future as we, as we, uh, as we speak. So I think one great sort of call I would like to make to the public sector is see these people, these powerful people for what they are. Mm. And they are the seeds of the transformation. They show the future. They're not people that decide doing funny things that are nice to illustrate some theory. No, <laughs> they are it. Yeah. They are what we have. And that's the breakthrough we all long for, that these people uh, are seen for what they are and that we learn from them yeah. instead of that we think it can be the other way around. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Behind that, yeah. Oh. Hey, um, thank you very much. This was really interesting. Uh, but it is about ownership. Huh? And sometimes the state seems geared towards uh, protecting public property, uh, private property as its first, first and foremost reason for being. Uh, it is in our inheritance laws. It's in the fact that private companies can behave like their own entities that accumulate wealth. Um, and it's if we don't change those kinds of, those kinds of laws, the actual redesigning of ownership will become very dif difficult. So I wonder if we don't need more lawyers, people who really go into the nitty gritty details of how we organize ourselves to really yeah, be true to our promise and actually redesign and thereby also redistribute ownership. Oh, the final thing is that we have ex, yeah, somehow given private companies called banks the <laughs> wonderful uh, opportunity or to create uh, money. And thereby, we have outsourced the, the, the really the, the heart, the core of creating wealth. So if we don't change those, I really like what we're doing, but it seems superficial to me. Marleen, is it superficial? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, no, I think it's very essential. Uh, and, it's, uh, and this is all um, to hope for, because this is, shows the vitality of civic society, it tells us that people care and that they can put their, their ideas, their values into action. So therefore I believe this is, this is where we have to uh, build our hopes on. And, our, and I think this, this idea of, of being a good ancestor. But I do, and I understand what you're saying, if, if we don't change, if there's not a real systemic, systemic change in, for example, how we deal with the financial system, like big capital, if we don't realize that, that how, we, um, how companies still benefit from extraction, and that we don't, a lot of them they don't even pay for, 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 for the cost that they cost the planet. If we don't solve that kind of issues, it can be too late. So I feel that there is, like we feel, all feel that there is, we only have a, a, a short time frame to, 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 to redesign or to rethink ownership or stewardship or how to, how to, how to the planetary boundaries, the social justice. Uh, the, the, so I think that, that to me, I understand that you say this. And I think, so we have to also redesign capital. We have to redesign uh, the, the systemic, uh, the legal systems that we have. And uh, one of the things that I really like a lot is the whole movement about uh, giving rights to the river, giving rights to nature, because, and I think that's the path that you were discussing. We don't own cats, but we, we do own, as, as if we own land, but, uh, the, but the land ha is also of itself. The North Sea is of itself. We have the ambassador of the North Sea. We, we see this kind, there's that kind of developments, and I realize that a lot of people that are, can, when you can put activism into law, that was really, really great. So we need more people that put their act activ uh, uh, activism yes. into that kind of fields of lawmaking so that it also change system have a systemic change on our society. Yeah. Before we go to the final question, I would like to ask Roman as well, is giving rights to non-human entities or objects, is, is that the way to go forward? 
I think in a legal sense, because we know in the late 19th century, in the United States, for example, corporations were given the same rights yeah, as people. Exactly. And that was a turning point in the history of um, financial capitalism. Mm -hmm. And it seems clear to me that, well, you can give a corporation right, you can give a, a river rights, you can, give, you can have an embassy of the North Sea, and all these things. And this is part of a revolution in law that's been going on in the last 20 or 30 years. I never, I'm a political scientist by background. I never used to think law was very interesting. Now, I love law, you know? <laughs> me too. Uh, yeah, and because <laughs> it's in law that we need to make it easy to start a community land trust and not be complicated, where we need to give rights to rivers and mountains and so, you know, savannas and all sorts of things like that. And we need to give rights to future generations. In fact, as I was listening tonight, in my notes, one of the things I was writing down was how often, you know, Kate and I are talking a lot about, um, and through Kate's work, the importance of reinventing what economics students are taught, like Econ 101. But it, what really struck me tonight was that if you want to create a, to do large donut deals and create, a, you know, live within the donut, you also need to reinvent law 101 as well. You know, and there's so often I come across people saying it's those old male white judges <laughs> who are holding back actually even taking on cases, oh. you know, in all sorts of fields. So it just seems to me this, this legal side is really important. And one other tiny thing. I love what you're saying about power, actually, Marlene, that, that, you know, history doesn't change without people rising up and disrupting things. And the creation of a larger commons and commons or civic public um, relationships requires the energy of individual project makers and change makers like we've heard from tonight, but also it takes mass movements, I would say. And I don't know what those would look like because most social movements in history have been making claims, direct claims on the states for traditional rights. Here we're asking for something different. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is, but it's made me think about it. All right, thanks so much. Um, have we got room for the final question that the, the third person here would like to ask, and that's the final question, and let's keep it short and sweet. Um, I'm realizing a new housing concept with uh, a lot of uh, other students, and we see that as pioneers or visionaries in uh, our time, uh, we need to cooperate with uh, the managers in the real estate uh, system, but also the entrepreneurs. and. I think those three groups, like the entrepreneurs, managers, and visionaries, um, really need to uh, work together. And we have a lot of uh, models we discussed this evening, uh, and of course, uh, the donut uh, economy. But what I'm uh, missing is a model for communication. Um, so I'm asking uh, to you, uh, are there models for communication? How can we... Um, make it more efficient uh, to realize uh, those concepts because there is already a lot of uh, information. Kate. Do, can you just say one more like, what do you mean communication? What, 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 is, what is lacking? What's stopping you from getting that done in terms of communication? Um, it is not the, the way how we can um, communicate because there are a lot of channels and we can, of course, communicate, but are there strategies or uh, how, um, how do I know to which uh, person do I have to go in a municipality or which uh, companies do I have uh, to uh, connect with or there is still missing a kind of model for how we need to uh, connect the, the, the dots. Like the dots are already there and the dots can uh, make a regenerative society, but uh, they are still not connected because we need to strive together, of course. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I can give one example from the city of Birmingham in the UK, where individual households are never going to all do a retrofit of their house of insulation and solar panels. And what they're trying to do is creating a hub in each neighborhood where you can go to find out who in the municipality do I need to talk to about this? Which company can actually help us do the retrofit? How can we do this together? It's just one model, but I, it, it, it's what is immediately coming to my mind about how do I find out where I go? What are the services? What's available? Which company I should trust? What subsidies are available? What legal rights do I need? 
that information, if, if I'm understanding your question correctly, really needs to be brought together so that students and people like yourself saying, we're actually creating a new initiative. Did you call yourselves visioneers, like pi visionary pioneers? Mm. Did I understand that? It's a great word, by the way, if mm. you just invented it. Um, <laughs> But should, you know, yourself and all the people who've been on the stage, and it sounds like you could absolutely been up here and talking about your, this project, the energy, the, the, it's voluntary time, it's energy, you're having to find so much information, you shouldn't have to work this hard to bring about the transformation that the entire city needs. So I completely agree with you. That information needs to be accessible and brought together so that... 10 other people don't have to go on the same trail as you mm. to try and figure the whole thing out again and again and again. I don't know what the answer looks like in this city, but I know there's a lot of people in this room who you can connect with who can start helping bring those dots together. A lot of, a lot of dots are in this room, and I want to recognise what Leongo said, a lot of dots are not in this room. Mm. Right. So it's about the accessibility of information, and even this digital age, the accessibility is lacking. Is that something that we, we, we can change, or how can we go about it? Uh, I think what, what we are what we, um, uh, seeing at the moment is that a lot of these kind of social movements come together mm -hmm. and, and, and starting to share the same values and thinking about how to, how to solve things. So you have the Reclaim Economics movement, you mm -hmm. have the... Uh, you have the the the, the, the public stack movement, like mm. the, like a reclaim the technology or people versus big tech movement. You have um, land ownership. The donut coalition. The Amsterdam donut, co Amsterdam. donut Amsterdam. coalition. Yeah. I hear. Um, so you see, but you see, so the, the, on, on this all these day, the same topics, you you the, the, you have the same question again and again, and mm. this is all revolving around ownership, stewardship, yeah. and 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 so I think. If we can uh, connect those dots and, and start to become more stronger uh, collectively working together, uh, you can also help new initiatives much faster. It yeah. is what we already know. Yeah. Um, so yes, th th I do believe this is this is the key to to and that they are not all separate movements. They are all connected around this idea of having. I think with ownership, it's uh, especially it's, it's more about taking your responsibility. Yeah. It's about empowerment and responsibility. And if we take those, and I think I like the idea of claiming it and sort of not waiting till somebody gives it to us, we can sort of reclaim it That's or what claim it. Said, that so uh, I, I heard something about a new squatter movement. I love that. So let's do that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Marlene. Thank you all. Thank you to all our guests because we've come to the end of the program. And thank you all for your inspiring stories, inspiring insights that we had. And I think that um, uh, my main takeaway is that we all should become, like you mentioned or invented tonight, we all should become visionaries. Um, uh, if you would like to share an idea with uh, Kwesi or if you would like to collaborate or if you would like to participate in the various workshops that will be organized about these topics and many other topics, please do send an email to hello at kwesi.nl and we'll make sure that you'll get in touch with the impact makers. Uh, we've uh, extended this program for a little bit, so thank you for your attention and thank you for watching us online as well. Hopefully we'll see you uh, next time and hopefully I will have such a dream table with guests as, uh, as, we, as I had tonight. Thank you so much again. Thank you to all our guests. See you later. Thank you.